Magandang umaga, Pilipinas! Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are joining around the world. Welcome to today's webinar where we will try to solve livestock diseases and zoonoses, how secure are biosecurity measures. We are streaming to you live through the Circa Online Learning and Virtual Engagements or Solve platform via Zoom and Facebook Live. My name is Jean Labios, and I am a program specialist of the Training for Development Unit under the Education and Collective Learning Department of CIRCA. I will be your moderator for today's webinar. The short video shown earlier has given you a glimpse about CIRCA and what we do. CIRCA is hosted by the Philippine government in the campus of the University of the Philippines, Los Banos. So we are coming to you live from Los Banos, Laguna, the special science and nature city of the Philippines. This SOLVE webinar is CIRCA's immediate response to the emerging impacts of the COVID-19 global, global pandemic on food security. By maximizing the use of information and communication technology platforms to inform, educate, and share evidence-based solutions and tested technologies, as well as best practices on the ground. If you are new to this webinar, this is actually the 23rd webinar since it was launched last April 28, 2020. In this webinar today, we will be joined by experts who will share their experiences and insights on emerging zoonoses, biosecurity measures, and surveillance systems in Southeast Asia. CIRCA's 11th five-year plan, which was launched in July 2020, identifies EcoHealth One Health applications to agriculture and rural development as one of the priority areas that would accelerate transformation through agricultural innovation. Before we proceed to our online conversation this morning, please allow me to quickly go over some statistics gathered from the SOLVE webinar held on January 27, 2021. The infograph shows that 73% of our online viewers were female and the rest were male. It also indicates that more than 100 individuals tuned in via Zoom, while almost 500 viewed the webinar through Circus Facebook page. Lastly, we are happy to note that we've had online attendees not only from the Philippines, but also from Australia, Brunei, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Thailand, Timor-Leste, US, UK, and Vietnam. Let me now quickly go over the program flow, which is currently shown on your screen. After my introduction and a few housekeeping rules, we will have our first speaker, Dr. Anthony Bukad, who is the officer in charge of the Animal Disease Control Section, Animal Health and Welfare Division, Bureau of Animal Industry of the Philippine Department of Agriculture. Dr. Bukad will discuss the Philippine government's initiatives on surveillance systems, including its regulatory arrangements on biosecurity. Dr. Tamsin Barnes, Senior Research Fellow in Veterinary Epidemiology at the University of Queensland, follows with her presentation on combating African swine fever in Timor-Leste using basic biosecurity measures. Our final presenter is Dr. Richard Koch, Professor of Wildlife Health and Emerging Diseases at the Royal Veterinary College, University of London. He will be discussing the animal-human interface, transmission mechanisms between animals and humans, and suggesting options for integrated outbreak investigation surveillance, and containment of emerging zoonoses. I hope you're all excited to listen to our speakers, but let me first encourage you to send us your questions. How do you do this? For those of you who are tuned in via Circus Facebook page, you may type your questions in the comments section. Kindly indicate your location now and or country of origin. If you are tuned in via Zoom, please post your questions or comments in the Q&A box which you would find in the menu bar on your screen. Kindly indicate your location and or country of origin as well. Our SOLVE team will collate, curate, and compile those questions for me, and I will convey them for our speakers. Hopefully, we will be able to cover as many questions as we can in the time remaining. Please be clear when you're posing a question to a specific speaker, or if it is a general question that anybody can respond to. We will do our best to get as many questions as possible during the open forum. Please note that this webinar will be recorded and will be made available on Circus Facebook page and YouTube channel. Today's presentations will be uploaded on Circus website at www.circa.org. 
The slides during the past webinars have already been posted there. For your social media posts, especially on insights or takeaways from this webinar, please use the hashtag CircaSolve. If you have issues or are experiencing technical difficulties with the Zoom online platform, please contact us at solve at circa.org. Moving on to today's presentations, our first speaker is Dr. Anthony Bukad, veterinarian too and current officer in charge of the Animal Disease Control Section, Animal Health and Welfare Division, Bureau of Animal Industry of the Philippine Department of Agriculture, or DABAI. Among his scope of work is assisting in the implementation of animal health and animal disease prevention and control programs. And this includes coordination with regional and local counterparts. He served as field veterinarian for DAVAI's bird flu project. And he was also veterinary quarantine inspector, field veterinarian, and compliance monitor livestock inspector for the National Food and Mouth Disease Task Force. Dr. Bukad holds a doctorate in veterinary medicine from the University of the Philippines, Los Banos. Here to present the Philippine government surveillance initiatives, please welcome Dr. Anthony Bukad. Again, good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, I'd like to express uh, on behalf of the Bureau of Animal Industry, our gratitude for being given an opportunity to present in today's activity. So as mentioned, I'm Dr. Anthony Buca, and I will be presenting to you the Philippine government initiatives on animal disease uh, prevention and control. So just an overview, as we, uh, the Philippines is composed of uh, three major island groups, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao, with 17 administrative regions, uh, covering 81 provinces, 145 cities, 1,489 municipalities, uh, with a total of 42,036 uh, barangays. At present, the estimated population of the Philippines is at 110 uh, million. The average meat consumption of each Filipino, at least uh, according to OECD uh, in 2017, is 28.8 kilograms, which is distributed to 14.2 kilograms in pork, 11.6 kilograms in chicken and other poultry products, and more or less five kilograms for beef, which all, will also translate to the structure of the livestock industry. So the Department of Agriculture is the lead agency taking care of the livestock industry of the country. So at present, this is the structure of the department. We're in the Bureau of Animal Industry is one of each uh, attached livestock agencies. Just a brief history about the Bureau of Animal Industry. The Bureau was founded January 31, 1930, by virtue of Republic Act Number no. 3639, together with the Bureau of Plant Industry. And through the years, BAI underwent several changes, both in structure and functions. And at present, we have five divisions and one focus group to cater the different needs and concerns of the industry. This is the present structure of the uh, Bureau of Animal Industry. So as you can see, the, diff the five different divisions and the specialized group, the research and development centers, or as we commonly call it, the farm operations group of the Bureau of Animal Industry. So the mandate of the Bureau of Animal Industry is shown in this slide. Given that we on I only have 15 minutes to, to present to you, I will not go over them word for word. So basically, there are five mandates for, for the Bureau of Animal Industry, and those mandates are, have been translated into the different objectives, such as formulate policies, plans, programs, and projects, disseminate uh, technological in, uh, information, monitor and evaluate livestock programs and projects, and provide technical assistance on different fields of the livestock industry, which is enumerated below. So the program thrust and strategies of the Bureau of Animal Industry are as follows. Animal genetic resource improvement and conservation, animal health, welfare, and quarantine, livestock and poultry trade competitiveness enhancement, quality assurance by safety and by security, feed veterinary drugs and products and biologic development, climate change and emergency preparedness, and institutional capacity and capability development. 
going to the top, uh, topic proper, uh, this is the outline of the presentation that will follow. So aside from the Republic Act that created the Bureau of Animal Industry, the following are the relevant uh, legal basis for the function of the Bureau of Animal Industry. Republic Act 7160 or the Local Government Code, which be, uh, through this uh, act, the function of the Bureau of Animal Industry at the national level has been devolved to the local government units. The Anti-Rabies Act of 2007. We also have RA 1111332 or the Mandatory Reporting of Notifiable Diseases and Health Events of Public Concern Act. We also have Batas, Batas Pampansa Bilang 97, uh, which covers the compulsory immunization of livestock. Of course, we also have the RA 8485 or the Animal Welfare Act of 1998, which is amended by RA 10631. And lastly, uh, RA 10611 or the Food Safety Act of 2013. These are just uh, a few of the relevant uh, legal issuances that are relevant to the function of the Bureau of Animal Industry for the livestock sector. So next is animal disease reporting. So we all know the importance of uh, animal uh, disease reporting as an important component of disease surveillance and the prompt and proper disease reporting is crucial to prevent the further spread of diseases uh, by institution of necessary uh, control, prevention and control measures. So we have a list of notifiable diseases as referred to the website of the World Organization for Animal Health. And with that, the Department of Agriculture issued uh, Administrative Order Number 1, 2012, declaring the list of notifiable diseases uh, in the country, which basically adopts the list of the OIE. The said circular was uh, revised by the Admin Circular Number 3, uh, which has some uh, amendments to the initial administrative order. There are 117 uh, notifiable diseases listed in the website of the OIE. So these are just the highlights of the points in the amendment of the original administrative order. So this is the reporting flow uh, for animal disease diseases. So if there are field reports of sick or, or dead animals, the natural uh, communication flow are the solid lines. While if there is an, a disease outbreak investigation to be conducted, the broken lines will show how it will be coordinated uh, among the different concerned offices. In, if there are samples to be tested in the laboratory, this is now the laboratory uh, services uh, process flow. So samples submitted by uh, farmers, uh, our, our local government, uh, counterparts or the regional field office uh, counterparts or field workers from the of the Department of Agriculture will submit uh, samples either directly to the Bureau of Animal Industry, Animal Disease Diagnosis and Reference Laboratory or to their respective uh, regional animal disease diagnostic laboratories. And if there are uh, laboratory test results that has to be con that has to be confirmed, especially for reporting purposes, uh, these samples will be submitted to, to BAI for confirmation and appropriate action. At present, this is the distribution of the different laboratories in the country. So for the Department of Agriculture, we have the reference lab, the, the ADDRL located in Metro Manila uh, under the management of the Bureau of Animal Industry and in the different regional field offices of the of DA, there are regional animal disease diagnostic laboratories. There are also uh, some local government units that have established their own animal disease diagnostic laboratories. And of course, we are also in working in coordination with the Research Institute for Tropical Medicine or RITM of the Department of Health. We have also uh, established or formed the Regional Quick Response Team or RQRT by virtue of DA Special Order Number 
353 series of 2016, the RQRTs are mandated to provide immediate response and action to reports of animal disease events and emergencies, and the composition of the team will be based on the recommendation of the, of the respective uh, regional directors of the DA. This slide shows the interaction between the different levels of offices of DA together with other livestock agencies and concerned stakeholders. So for animal uh, surveillance, we have five surveillance activities that are being conducted, categorized into passive, active, clinical, laboratory and event-based surveillance. So passive surveillance basically is the general surveillance being relied upon by the Bureau of Animal Industry as this will be dependent on the reporting of animal diseases uh, from the field based on monitoring reports, while active surveillance will cover the samples that were collected in the field based on purpose that are, they are intended to. In the active surveillance, it will also cover the, sam the, sampling, the sampling and laboratory testing that we do as part of regulatory requirement. So for example, if there are at present, if there are shipment of birds or poultry or going to other uh, regions, one of the requirements is that the, the, the farm should be accredited and has been tested for avian influenza. So clinical surveillance will rely on field and or laboratory reports of animal diseases based on clinical signs and symptoms, which will then be confirmed in the laboratory that will comprise the laboratory surveillance. We also rely on the event-based surveillance wherein reports that are shared by the DOH through their uh, epidemiology unit are also being coordinated with the Bureau of Animal Industry. So for border control, uh, the Philippines has uh, many entry points for uh, transboundary animal diseases. Thus, we have 85 airports, 10 of which are international gateways. We have 429 fish ports and 821 commercial ports. And of course, we are also along the route of migratory birds. We have pre-border policies in place. One of these is the DA Admin Order Number 16, 2006, or the pre-border measures for the export of meat and meat products to the Philippines, which is also supported by uh, DA Memorandum Circular Number 12, Series of 2017, uh, providing guidelines for the importation procedures of, uh, for live animals. In the, if there are uh, disease events in other countries, uh, especially those that are reported to the OIE, uh, the Department of Agriculture will then issue necessary legal issuances to impose temporary ban on the importation of uh, live animals, their products and byproducts, depending on the disease of concern. Shown in the screen is an example of, a leak of our issuance concerning AI affect, uh, even influenza affected countries or zones. Well, this is an example of a memorandum order uh, imposing temporary ban on importation of uh, domestic and wild pigs and their products, including pork, meat, and semen originating from ASF affected countries. We have also installed several measures at our airports and seaports. Uh, such as X-ray machines as part of uh, inspection of luggages and installation of foot baths along the walkway of the airport terminal. Uh, this slide shows uh, some procedures uh, conducted if uh, there are uh, countries that would be uh, exporting their products to the Philippines. So this, uh, the Bureau, the Department of Agriculture will uh, usually after reviewing or evaluating all the documentary uh, requirements that were submitted by concerned country, we'll create an, a DA inspection mission team that will go to the country to validate uh, the information provided by 
by the country counterpart. So here you can see uh, inspection of the animal facility. Also, we look into the animal uh, raising practices of the country. And if there are meat products that will be uh, exported to the Philippines, we also go to their uh, processing plants. So for biosecurity, uh, we all know that basically this is the definition of biosecurity according to FAO. It is a strategic and integrated approach that encompasses the policy and regulatory frameworks for analyzing and managing relevant risk to human, animal, and plant life and health and associated risk to the environment. Thus, the Bureau of Animal Industry has drafted a manual of procedures for the National Biosecurity Guidelines of the Philippines. Uh, at present, the, the document is still in its development stage, but once uh, it has been finalized, it will be circulated to our stakeholders as reference for their operations. We also do uh, biosecurity awareness campaigns. Sampung utos ng biosecurity basically means 10 commandments for biosecurity, wherein we discuss to different stakeholders uh, at the different levels the basic principles of biosecurity for them to uh, observe to prevent any disease event in their uh, farm. May it be commercial or backyard setting. On the aspect of awareness campaign, uh, here are some samples that uh, we have at present. We have, and majority of our awareness campaigns are uh, colla in collaboration with other agencies and institutions. For example, the one that is being flashed on the screen is uh, the, the promotion of the rabies uh, program uh, of the Philippines, uh, wherein rabies education has been integrated in lesson plan that is being taught in the schools, especially for children. So we also utilize the different media platforms that we have, may it be the, the major tri-media arm or the social media platform. We celebrate Rabies Awareness Month. Usually this is celebrated during the month of March and different activities uh, highlighting the rabies uh, program of the country is being initiated. At the height of... Uh, the avian influenza outbreak in the Philippines uh, last 2017, uh, the Bureau of Animal Industry utilized uh, the social media platform to, for its information campaign. And some of our uh, information materials that are, have been printed were also circulated in the online platform. Another example of uh, IEC or awareness campaign that we did uh, is the celebration of the World Antibiotic Awareness Week. So this is usually uh, celebrated in the month of November. So this is just an example of uh, the events that took place last 2017. For emergency preparedness, uh, the Bureau of Animal Industry, together with our uh, private stakeholders and technical experts, uh, developed several manual of procedures which, will, which is used as a reference for information on the government's preventive program and preparedness plan. So we have present the manual procedures for rabies, for avian influenza, the contingency plan for African swine fever, the foot and mouth disease emergency preparedness plan, which was developed, uh, but especially because that uh, the Philippines has been recognized globally as FMD-free country without vaccination. Uh, all these materials are regularly reviewed for revision if needed. Along with that, also we conduct several capacity building activities uh, for our counterparts. Some of them are conducted in collaboration with other agencies. For example, in this slide, uh, we have uh, conducted a training for uh, a training course for uh, incident command system uh, 
application in disease situations. So during those trainings for uh, on incident command, it one of the highlights is a conduct of a tabletop simulation exercise. On the on this side is the conduct of a simula field simulation uh, exercise. So uh, what has been learned uh, during tabletop simulation exercises have been expanded to field exercises to evaluate uh, each agency's or each uh, office's uh, capability to respond in the event of a disease incursion. So with that, maraming salamat po. Thank you, Dr. Bukad, for sharing with us the Philippine government's initiatives on animal disease prevention and control. We note the reporting and communication flow of animal diseases in the Philippines, and we do hope that the discussion of DABAI's surveillance and control system has helped provide a guideline to our concerned stakeholders when it comes to reporting and preventing animal disease events and emergencies that occur in the country. Our next speaker, we have Dr. Tamsin Barnes, a Senior Research Fellow in Veterinary Epidemiology at the University of Queensland in Australia. She is a veterinary graduate from Cambridge University, United Kingdom, and holds a PhD on hydatid infection in kangaroos and wallabies from the University of Queensland. Dr. Barnes has worked on a variety of research for development projects in Southeast Asia, including the Philippines and Timor-Leste, and production animal projects in Australia. This includes the epidemiology and management of bovine respiratory disease in feedlot cattle. Her paper, First Steps in Managing the Challenges of ASF or African Swine Fever in Timor-Leste, was published online last year in the One Health Journal and will be the focus of her talk today. Dr. Barnes, the screen is yours. Thank you. Uh, can you all see my presentation now? Right. Uh, and firstly, I'd like to thank the team from DERCA for the opportunity to talk uh, um, in this 23rd SOLVE webinar. And I'd also like to thank um, my, my project team here um, about the work that I'm going to talk about today, in particular, Alavia Moray, who was the, really the go-to person um, for all the, the, the field work um, that we did uh, in Timor-Leste. I think my talk today is going to be a, a quite an interesting contrast to the one given just now by Dr. Anthony, who was talking at the national level, because I'm going right down to the other end of the spectrum about biosecurity measures for individual smallholder farmers. So first, a little bit of background about Timor-Leste, for those of you who aren't um, so familiar. Um, it forms the eastern um, side of the island of Timor, on the eastern end of the um, Nusitangara chain of islands. Um, it's a very young nation, became independent in 2002. Uh, and it's a small country classified as a lower middle income country, but both the median in income and the education levels are really uh, very low. The pigs in Timor-Leste are really, really important. Um, in the most recent census with published data, so that's pre-ASF, um, most, most households are rearing pigs, uh, but they've only usually got only one or two pigs. And they're the second most, they were the second most numerous um, livestock um, that were kept by, by people. They're also very important because they're considered to be women's animals. Um, women play a key role in, in raising them, um, and they're considered to be feminine social goods. And pigs are really important for cultural purposes in Timor, and in Timor, culture is really important. So they're required for traditional ceremonies, um, any wedding, funeral, new house, etc. cetera, um, there will be a traditional ceremony and pigs are required there for both for immediate consumption and also for exchange. So we end up with this sort of melting pot of um, pigs and people traveling all over the country uh, on a frequent basis. So it's a perfect setting for disease transmission. They're also required as offerings to ancestors um, to try and ensure a good harvest or the health of, of a sick, a, a sick, a sick uh, family member. And not the idea of not being able to meet the cultural obligations of providing pigs when they're required um, is sort of untenable to, to most Timorese because of the potential loss of face or bad fortune that might um, result. They're also an important source of income. 
um, there's a disposable income to use the school fees and also as a, as a literal piggy bank, the same as they are in many other countries. Now, just to give you a bit of um, context of the value of the pigs, of pigs relative to um, uh, people's earnings, um, wean piglets will typically sell for 80 to 100 US dollars. And this large pig down at the bottom here um, during our project sold for $1,200. $1, and prior to African swine fever arriving in, in Timor-Leste, the typical um, pig system was uh, free roaming. So anywhere and everywhere you would go, you would see uh, free roaming pigs everywhere. But it's a low input system and the pigs would feed largely by scavenging and also um, with supplementary, with a bit of supplementary feeding. Now, a few of the pigs were kept, um, were kept tethered, um, and, but a few, and, and just a very small number kept um, in pens, fully confined. And there's also a wild pig population, but nobody really has any idea of the, the size of it. So this basic situation that it, it, there is complete lack of biosecurity uh, among the pig population, and this it really is the perfect situation for disease transmission. So unfortunately, what happened uh, towards the end of 2019 was that there was um, a report of a lot of dead pigs in Dili, and by later on that month, that was confirmed, um, that the cause of those deaths was confirmed to be African swine fever. And the disease basically spread like wildfire through much of the island uh, or much of the country, uh, with mass mortalities in many areas. So if you went and, and, and spoke to people, you would just, and asked about the pigs, you would hear, fahi matehotu, all the pigs are dead. Um, so basically there would be pretty much no free roaming um, pigs left in some of those areas. And people didn't know what to do with the dead pigs. They were just thrown away, as you can see in, in, in that watercourse on, on the right-hand side. Um, and also people would be tr were trying to sell cheap pork um, by the roadside. So nobody really knows um, how many pigs have died. Uh, the reporting system there is, is a little bit lacking, um, but the official report was close to 38,000 by the end of March last year. Uh, but when I asked a couple of colleagues from the Ministry of Agriculture, one said, oh, I reckon maybe 50,000 have died. And another, another colleague said, oh, I think it's more like 70% of the pig population. So a massive, massive insult to the, pit, to the pigs in Timor-Leste and the people who are heavily dependent on them. So at the time of the disease incursion, um, I was um, leading a, um, a project, um, a research for development project, looking at trying to find um, practical husbandry options for smallholder pig farmers. So it was a really small participatory project with a few farmers who were already keeping confined pigs and working with them and their respective livestock and veterinary technicians. And our focus was on trying to get the pigs to grow, to grow better um, using diets of locally available ingredients. So our original research question was, can we get pigs to grow cost effectively on diets of homegrown and locally available ingredients in the actual local context rather than in a sort of uh, a managed, a more managed setting? But all of a sudden, we had a different problem uh, and we had to adapt on the fly. We needed to work out, can we keep these pigs free from ASF and keep them alive? So that led us, obviously, to the need to introduce the concept of biosecurity, um, which is pretty much esoteric to um, most team rears. So we rapidly put together um, a one day training session um, a month after the disease arrived in the country. Uh, for our farmers and for our technicians. And so in the morning in that day, it was um, a sort of a, a discussion, a, a sort of some, lex, some ex, uh, verbal and pictorial explanations about um, the principles of biosecurity and also trying to specifically tailor the things that the, the, these farmers and technicians would need to do, tailored specifically to their individual context. And then... In the afternoon, we um, had a role play session um, where the farmers and the technicians had to go through the activities that they'd be needing to do on their own farms going forwards. So we had that one day training session. And then this is Alavio here uh, on, on the left hand side. He went and he continued to do monthly follow up visits with um, our farmers and, and the technicians. So what we decided was 
practical for these farmers to do in these conditions um, was to um, set up a metal fence around the around the pen with a door, and so that only farmers and technicians were allowed in, and hopefully we would try and we would keep other animals out as well. We had a lot of trouble with chickens getting in. Um, the farmers, um, their basic protocol was to um, clean their hands and um, change their boot, change their boots as they went into the pig pen area. And the technicians were to do a similar thing, but they also were provided with overalls specific to each farmer because they were um, visiting other farms, so a higher risk of transmission. And they had access to some Burkon to disinfect as required. So this is what the, the setting looked like. So um, on the left, you can see what um, one of our pig pens was like prior to the introduction of our biosecurity measures. So already a lot more secure in terms of um, disease prevention than the free roaming situation that I showed you before. But that got tightened up with the in inclusion of um, the fence and also then just in, in, inside, inside the door um, was set up with the boots and disinfectant for um, farmers and technicians to change easily just as they came in through the door. So what happened? Um, well, we had nine farmers in our um, growing pig trials and three of those farmers were very lucky during the time frame of uh, our project. They lived in sukus that were sukus or villages, um, so a bit like a barangay in the Philippines. Um, that were not obviously affected by ASF. So they, each of those farmers had both fence picks that were in our trial, pens and fence picks, and two of them also had um, unfenced pigs that were either um, free range or tethered. And uh, all of those pigs survived. There were no mortalities in either, in either group. But in contrast, we had six farmers who were in sukus where there was extensive um, mortalities due to ASF, uh, to the extent that there were pretty much no other pigs around um, by the end of the, the trial. And all six of those farmers um, suffered mortalities of their unfenced pigs. So some of these pigs were free roaming, some were tethered and some were penned, but basically everybody who had an unfenced pig, they, they all died during that time. Whereas in contrast, we just had one farmer um, who had mortalities among his um, pigs that were both um, penned and fenced. So the overall take home message initially is that the biosecurity appears to work and our farmers could keep their pigs relatively disease free. But there were some challenges um, that we encountered that I'd like to reflect a little bit on. Um, one of our farmers, the one who's, whose pigs died despite being, um, being fenced, they had uh, all of their 11 pigs died and uh, this was shortly before they he had the potential to sell these pigs um, for about seven thousand dollars for a, um, a special um, traditional ceremony and these pigs didn't die at the time of the main outbreak going through um, that suku they died about two months afterwards um, and what had happened early on during the main outbreak was that other farmers, they didn't know what to do with their dead pigs and they didn't have any support. So some of them had been um, just left in disused water tanks um, up the hill behind this farmer's um, um, place. And then the rainy season started. And we think that one of the reasons how the disease got in was um, it being basically washed down from the carcasses above and also the farmer did notice that there were dogs that came into his yard with um, bits of carcass um, from dead pigs. Um, so there we've got sort of a, a, a challenge to the best of good intentions of biosecurity, largely by improper carcass disposal by others. And then another challenge that we encountered was a, was a social one. Um, one farmer had several of his pigs die. Um, this was before he constructed his fence, but his pigs were, were penned and were pretty well looked after. Um, and again, this problem, this incident occurred after um, the disease had sort of wreaked havoc through, the, through that suku. Um, 
But what he found was that in the water tank that he was using to um, provide water to his pigs was that somebody had um, put in part of a carcass. Um, and he, we think that that was what had underpinned um, their death. Um, and so he believes he believes that that was an action from a jealous farmer. And I was quite taken aback at this sort of um, potential attitude. But another farmer mentioned a similar problem. He was terrified that um, his neighbours would throw uh, a carcass or something similar into his pigs um, to to destroy them. And it turned out that um, talking to more people that that social jealousy and actions such as this is has been reported before as a concern for um, development projects in Timor-Leste. And there's also documented evidence of um, deliberate attempts to spread African spine fever in a similar kind of malicious way um, on the Kenya and the border in Africa. So now I think we can conclude biosecurity works, but only if people more generally understand, not just specifically um, one, um, an individual pig farmer. So because of the, the social issues that had become apparent, um, we felt that there was the lack of awareness. It was the lack of awareness that was underpinning the, the jealousy and the poor practices such as the carcass disposal. And so the risk to any a small number of farmers doing the right thing amongst greater disease pressure was always going to be high until people had a better understanding. So that led us to conduct some public awareness sessions. And we did one in each of the sukus where the project was active, where we had a trial farmer and also at an agricultural high school. And at the time we did, we did all of that. Um, pigs were dying in the areas, obviously, um, but none of, the, none of the participants had any knowledge of African swine fever. Um, and it was also a real challenge to communicate the problem generally because um, most people had a very limited understanding of disease and it, in the local the local language tetan um, there isn't even a word for, for virus so Alavia was trying to explain this as like a, a small parasite there's a word for parasite but it's 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 a parasite of a size that you can see um, so he was trying to explain the concept of the virus as being a very small parasite that you can't see that causes disease. So it was very challenging um, due to the sort of widespread low education levels. So that was really the, the end of our project. Uh, and, and I, um, but I'm pleased to, to say that there is currently an ongoing project, um, a safe source, safe destination restocking program that's trying to get um, farmers back raising pigs in Timor because they desperately want to. Um, so what they're doing is they're locating, identifying safe sources um, of pigs um, that are low risk in certain areas of the country based on a serological survey, and then to identify safe des destinations. And they're trying to take a whole of village approach there. So like everybody in the village who's keeping pigs will need to keep them in the, the, the sort of the, the, the approved the approved manner rather than one farmer trying to sort of um, fight the disease um, on, on their own. So the idea is that they will go into um, biosecurity approved pens and they'll be, um, they will follow sort of safe management practices. That's a three year project, a three year funding. I think it's coming into sort of, it's still early days, maybe six months on. And the project does have strong political support within the country. But based on our experiences of, of what we've seen from the public awareness sessions, et cetera, there really is going to be a lot of training required to. Um, Make, to enable this project to be successful. So just before I finish, I'd like to talk about um, a little bit about a nice story about one farmer's recovery. Um, this farmer um, had about 50 free roaming pigs of his own in addition to the trial pigs. And all those free roaming pigs died in November of uh, 2019. Uh, but he still had his, his, his trial pigs. Um, and now he's he's um, keeps all his pig, pigs either penned or tethered and within a perimeter fence. So it's not quite as rigorous as what we were trying to instigate, um, but it's much more rigorous than what he had before. 
Uh, he doesn't allow anybody to come in to um, access his pigs. He's improved the management through better feeding, so he's getting more breeding going on. And now he has many more pigs than he had before the uh, ASF outbreak, and he sold a lot of piglets. And I have heard recently that he's invested quite a lot of that, those funds back into improving the in his infrastructure on, on the farm and put in a bore so because water was always a problem for him. Um, and um, bought a rice mill so that he can work on the feeding. So um, take a message from, from his success really is that I think um, Timurie's farmers can still raise pigs successfully, um, as can others in a similar context. Um, they just need to adopt appropriate biosecurity measures. So to conclude, um, biosecurity measures are really essential for smallholder farmers where African swine fever is present and um, they can actually be adopted successfully in very basic settings um, but enhanced awareness and understanding amongst the community is essential um, and a group level approach is going to be beneficial. Um, the scientific principles of biosecurity are obviously very important uh, but so too is the human behaviour component so we really need vets and scientists and social scientists and all community members um, to work together um, to enable greater potential for biosecurity measures to be adopted uh, and then to continue to be used longer term to improve animal health and human livelihoods. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge um, funding contributions from ACR and TOMAC and thank my colleagues from the Ministry of Agriculture in both the national and uh, municipal offices, colleagues from TOMAC, um, in, in Dili and around, and of course, um, all the Timorese farmers for their uh, enthusiasm and wonderful um, Timorese hospitality. And there are, I do have um, some additional material available. It's all freely available to download um, the article that was mentioned earlier on in the introduction and the report from our project um, and some technical guides produced for um, both farmers and technicians. Thank you. And with that, I will hand back to Jean. Yes, thank you, Dr. Barnes, for sharing with us your research project in implementing biosecurity measures in fighting against African swine fever in Timor-Leste. It was interesting to learn about the actions taken by the Timorese farmers and technicians to overcome their problem with ASF. And the results of the study goes to show that it is important to raise awareness and understanding of biosecurity in farms and communities. Uh, again, may I remind our online attendees watching the webinar via Facebook Live, please start typing your questions in the comments section, including your location or country of origin. If you are tuned in via Zoom, please post your questions in the Q&A box, which you will find in the menu bar on your screen. While waiting for our speaker, next speaker's presentation to be shared on the screen, please allow me to tell you more about him. Dr. Richard Koch is a veterinary ecologist and infectious disease researcher in the field of wildlife health focused on Africa and Asia. He works at the interface between animals, humans, and environment, which is One Health, and on the impact of food systems in this disease emergence and environmental change. He has worked for 40 years as a professional 28 years attached to the Zoological Society of London, and 11 years as Professor of Wildlife Health and Emerging Diseases at the Royal Veterinary College in London. He was awarded with the FAO Bronze Medal in 2010 in recognition of contributions to the eradication of rinderpest virus and the Tom and Beth Williams Award, Wildlife Disease Association, for exceptional contributions to understanding wildlife disease of policy relevance. Currently, his research portfolio is 1.5 million euros in grants. He also established a One Health master's program and lectures on One Health and wildlife diseases. Without further ado, his, here is Dr. Cox's presentation. Good morning. My name is Richard Cox, Professor of Wildlife Health and Emerging Diseases at the Royal Veterinary College. I'm going to talk to you about zoonoses and emerging infectious diseases. And with a focus on wildlife, um, really to improve understanding uh, about this poorly understood problem. 
So the learning objectives are really to, to understand the role wild animals play in zoonosis, emergence and spread at local and global level, and outline the animal-human interface and transmission mechanisms between animals and humans, and to reinforce the um, importance of domestic animals actually in this uh, area. Understand the key drivers of emergence, which uh, really are the domestic environment, and suggest options for integrated outbreak investigation, surveillance and containment to major zoonosis, especially those derived from wild animals, which are, are quite rare. A few very important definitions. Wildlife is a term that is often misapplied. Correct definition is naturally occurring animal species, which has co-evolved in a natural ecosystem. So for this lecture, I'm talking really about free-ranging wildlife in nature. The terms used to describe wild animals which are exotic, feral, um, alien invasive species, captive and farmed animals, but they're not wild, of course. And zoonoses, this is also uh, a term often misapplied. These are diseases that are naturally transmissible infections from animals to humans, and therefore there has to be an animal reservoir leading to infection. And it can occur in the reverse way, and it's called a reverse zoonosis or a zoanthroponosis. Zoonotic origin disease is not necessarily a zoonosis. Uh, it could be an emerging human pathogen, uh, and actually the animals are, are uh, pretty irrelevant to the ongoing disease. And if we look at zoonoses um, in the human field, uh, over 900 of them uh, exist. Um, about 90% of all human pathogens actually are multi-host, uh, so you should re realize this. And that's out of a total of about 1,400 human pathogens. Of course, a, a tiny proportion of the microorganisms on this planet. Of these, um, about 60, so in other words, 61 percent of human pathogens have a zoonotic origin or, or are zoonoses. 70 percent of livestock pathogens uh, can be zoonotic. 90 percent of carnivore pathogens can be transmitted zoonotically. 75 percent of emerging human diseases are zoonotic in origin. Not many ongoing zoonoses, however. Of the emerging uh, zoonotic origin viruses, 63% originate in nature, less than half of animal source. 99% of, of uh, ongoing endemic and epidemic zoonoses are from domesticated species, and this is really an important point that is often misunderstood. Um, and species that are in peri-domestic environments, so it's really a domestic problem. Wildlife zoonoses, that's direct infection from wildlife, naturally, extremely rare and we should uh, uh, emphasize this um, but occasional pathogen jumps are important from nature but these actually are extremely rare so these are some publications for you to, to look at there are a number of different types of hosts of course uh, and, and that's why i emphasize the reservoir or maintenance maintenance hosts is being critical that's where the microorganism uh, it preferentially um, uh, circulates and then, of course, spillover hosts are those which are not typical for this um, microorganism, but can actually be infected. And, and that really describes most of the zoonoses, uh, essentially spillovers from a reservoir in animals to humans. And, of course, dead-end host uh, is, is often uh, the result of the, that spillover. But on occasions, and that's when we talk about pathogen jumps and so on, um, uh, a new host becomes a maintenance host. Uh, and many emergent human pathogens are of that type. Of course, bacteria, parasites, viruses, prions are Just to give you a few examples of human pathogens which are evolved from wildlife source organisms. So influenza, um, A, avian influenza viruses, mixed with pigs, poultry, other uh, domestic species, and can become human viruses and human pandemics. Uh, human immunodeficiency virus probably came from simian immunodeficiency virus. That's a primate virus sometime maybe 70 80 years ago um, but we're you know we don't have absolute certainty but certainly it uh, looks like that also the SARS viruses um, which are very topical at the moment um, they're human pathogens it's very important that we know that and their origin actually is uncertain we think bats may be involved um, and perhaps some other intermediate species like uh, uh, the, the, the fur trade carnivores, for example, might well be the, uh, a major driver for the emergence of this virus, but, but we still do not know um, really how this has occurred. Rabies is well known, um, originally probably in bats, uh, but really now it's a, dog, a domestic dog disease that spills over to humans occasionally.
Things like dengue virus, a very dominant disease globally, maybe 150 years ago. It was only really in primates, occasionally spilling to people. It's now very much a human disease. So viruses are a, are, are a, a common sort of um, pathogens of humans that have emerged from uh, nature and animals. Of course, there are bacteria and parasites of the same kind, but, but they're less frequent. Uh, Examples would be bovine tuberculosis, for example. Um, actually, um, you know, an animal pathogen evolved from a human source. So, you know, the, the zooanthropinosis, the reverse zoonosis. Zoonotic pathogens from wildlife reservoirs. So these can come directly from wildlife. Uh, things like Lassa fever, Hantavirus, Plague, um, West Nile virus. And then um, rarely things like monkeypox, Ebola virus, we believe comes from uh, bats. It's not proven, but uh, we believe it does. Nipah virus, of course, is well known um, and understood the epidemiology involving both domestic animals and, and bats as a reservoir host. Hendra is the same, again, bats as a reservoir host. And rabies very rarely comes from wildlife directly. Also, parasites can be similar. So if you look at uh, kinococcosis, for example, trypanosoma brucei, trichinella, and then bacteria, things like Lyme borreliosis, tularemia, leptospirosis. If we look at the UK, for example, we can see the sort of numbers of cases annually. This is going back to 2009, uh, and we can see the dominant diseases. The vast majority of these actually from domestic animals, so pastorellosis from cats, toxoplasmosis from uh, domestic cats, um, Q fever from goats, psittacosis from pet parrots, um, and leptospirosis from a mixture of wildlife and, and like rodents um, and, and some domestic animals. Lyme borreliosis can come directly from, say, uh, wild deer and, and uh, ticks, but, but actually the majority of Lyme cases in the UK come from sheep. And some of these are notifiable, so if, you know, anthrax is extremely rare, TB, uh, etc. And if we look at the most common wildlife associated infections in, in humans globally, so zoonoses, Lassa fever, rabies, uh, but, but mostly uh, quite rare. We don't spend a lot of money on zoonoses, to be honest. I, I did some work uh, looking at burden of disease and just uh, you know, crude estimates using a log scale to show how rare direct source wildlife uh, to human infections are, uh, because they really are in the tens or the hundreds in the majority globally, annually. So they're very, very, very rare indeed, with a few exceptions, of course. Um, but wildlife, um, you know, here, for example, you have um, to total human cases of the darker line, uh, human cases with probable wildlife source with the lighter line. So you can see for rabies, very, very few wildlife source, the vast majority from domestic animals. Lassa fever is a direct um, rodent infection, but actually the rodent is semi-domestic. It's uh, Mastomus natalensis lives and uh, around agriculture and, and human habitation. So it's really like a domestic, uh, domesticated or domesticating rat uh, and plague. It's not really a wild animal. Um, so I hope that gives you a, a sense that uh, it really is an unusual thing. This is just to show a, a classic zoonosis like Lyme disease. So the bacteria, lots of reservoirs, uh, different vectors, um, and you get infection in, in domestic animals, um, uh, dogs, horses, and so forth, and you get disease in humans. So it's a sort of complex, multi-host, high, you know, high um, um, opportunity, really, uh, where you have mixed species. Um, and essentially, um, you know, the, the cycle includes some, some so-called wild animals. Uh, these are pretty domesticated, actually, the, the rabbit and the, and, and the sparrow. Um, and then you have domestic animals like sheep, and it can infect humans, and the tick acts as the vector. And then you have the si ongoing cycle in nature between a variety of species. Rabies, again, classic zoonoses all over the world. A lot of deaths every year um, and you know a number of hosts but the problem is domestic dogs um, and and that's where the solution is just to give you a, a sense it's a global global issue so what are the consequences of emerging diseases because this is another topic which is so uh, common now um, of course, human infection, debility, and death. Um, emerging infections uh, tend to occur at the interface between animals and people um, and obviously difficult to detect, uh, in fact. Uh, for example, HIV AIDS took 50 years or more before the virus was really understood uh, that it had actually jumped species. Uh, 
And of course, where it's endemic in wildlife populations, it's very difficult to eradicate. Um, very costly, as you know, from COVID-19. But really, we need to understand what, what emerging infectious diseases of humans are. It's really one whose incidence has increased recently or that threatens to increase in the near future, but it's very broadly defined. So it's rather difficult actually to do analysis or to interpret analysis that's been done on emerging diseases. They can include novel pathogens, they can be antimicrobial resistance pathogens, variant known pathogens, um, pathogens with shifting geographies, re-emerging pathogens. So it's a very important if you do analysis to actually define what you mean. But there are many factors related to disease emergence, some which are intrinsic, like mutation, genetic recombination of organisms, and this is very common in RNA viruses. But I think major factors include loss of resilience in our ecosystem, so biodiversity loss is a major cause of emergence of infectious diseases, and I think the large population of domestic animals and humans and the human domestic landscapes are the primary drivers for the emerging diseases, and, and behavior of humans, uh, such as uh, uh, globalization, um, are also related. This is the cost of development. Wolf provided some uh, useful ideas about how pathogen jumps actually occur. And here you can see a classic zoonosis, rabies. It requires the animal. It, it's not a human to human disease. Something like Ebola, we believe, comes through intermediate animals to people, although it's still not really proven. Um, dengue, again, probably jumped into humans, the, the virus, and no longer needs primates. And that is really what we mean by pathogen jump. And HIV was a complete pathogen jump. And I would say that COVID-19 is similar. It's a complete pathogen jump. There isn't a reservoir of this virus, actually. It's now a human virus. Of course, emerging pathogens like avian influenza um, over the last 30 years, particularly important in Southeast Asia. Um, and there's a bit of detail I give you in, in terms of the, the virus. But in terms of wild birds, they're not really a reservoir of these highly pathogenic viruses. They uh, are highly adapted to influenza viruses. Avian influenza viruses really are, come from nature, but they are low pathogenicity. But they can obviously vector highly pathogenic viruses. But the driver for, the, for this is in the poultry industry, particularly the domestic duck industries and so on, which have grown rapidly in Southeast Asia in particular, but globally over the last 30 years. So it's really a problem of of our expansion of that industry. Uh, and so the cycles you know, um, of virus and the genetics and the evolution involves a whole bunch of processes. But the main drivers are humans and, and the domestic uh, industries. And of course, it spills into other mammals and so forth. So this was a definition, which I think is still very valid from Sarah Cleveland, um, that the increasing demand for animal protein associated with the growth and intensification of animal agriculture, live animal transport, live animal markets, bushmeat consumption, um, more rarely so, habitat destruction, and the ability to infect multiple hosts is really what emerging diseases, the classic ones, are, are all about. Of course, uh, if we have greater contact with wildlife um, or wild places, we do take certain risks. Um, but this still remains a, a pretty low source of ongoing disease uh, concern. But major changes like deforestation, encroachment and so on are having dramatic effects. And the creation of the human landscape, um, increasing trade, global spread, etc., are, are now a common problem. Just want to mention certain agencies which are, are important. The IUCN um, has a, a wildlife health specialist group, and you can you can have a look at uh, what they do. Of course, the uh, World Animal Health Organization also has a wildlife working group, and they do uh, look at zoonoses and so forth. So do FAO. And the Wildlife Disease Association is another organization with some representation in Southeast Asia uh, where you can join and, and get involved. So the main conclusions I want to get across to you today are that wildlife zoonoses are rare, but uh, important human pathogens have evolved from organisms, organisms infecting wildlife species. But actually, it's the conditions created in the domestic animal production systems and in human landscapes that provide the opportunities for pathogen jumping and evolution, amplification, amplification and spread directly or through livestock to humans. So really, the solution is with us. We don't need to worry about nature. In fact, if we can restore biodiversity and nature globally, we will actually reduce the, 
the occurrence and frequency. Uh, but in order to do that, we're going to have to significantly decrease the domestic animal population, particularly for food. Um, and this is something that will become of greater concern and interest, I think, in the international policy arena. And it's very important that you think and consider this in parts of the world where there's still an expansion of the domestic animal industries. These are uh, further resources and reading material, and it's been Uh, thank you, Dr. Koch, for sharing with us the different kinds of pathogens and factors related to disease emergence, such as biodiversity losses and globalization. We understand that conditions created in domestic animal production systems and human landscapes provides opportunities for pathogen jumping and evolution directly or through livestock teams. With that, let us now move on to the open forum. We have Dr. Bukat and Dr. Barnes joining us in the following segment of our program. Uh, Dr. Koch, unfortunately, will not be able to join the discussion, so we'll be only, we will be able to answer questions addressed to Dr. Bakud and Dr. White Barnes. The first question is directed to Dr. Bakud, and this was asked via Zoom by Mark Corpus. Uh, this was already answered by Dr. Bakud, but we'd like you to answer it live, sir, so we can share the information to our audience as well. The question is, uh, from Ilocos Sur, Philippines, what is the state of swine flu virus in the Philippines? Some of the piggery farms here in Ilocos Sur are not buying piglets in neighboring province due to the, to the disease to avoid the spread of the disease. What is your solution to this problem? Small piggeries are not continuing to start their business due to this. Thank you. Dr. Bukad? So to, to answer that question, so if... If our colleague is pertaining to African swine fever and not swine flu, uh, our office has not received any other reports of new cases in the province of Ilocos Sur. So far, uh, out of the four provinces of Ilocos Region or Region 1, uh, only Ilocos Norte remains free from ASF. At the moment, movement restrictions are still in place, especially for animals coming from affected areas in accordance to the uh, DA National Zoning and Movement Plan. In addition, the Department of Agriculture will soon roll out repopulation or restocking guidelines to the affected areas and to intensify production in ASF-free uh, areas. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Dr. Uh, so I guess uh, for our colleague who answered, uh, who asked this question, uh, we encourage you to report your uh, concern to the ABAI for this to be uh, addressed. Our next question is for Dr. Barnes, and um, it asks, what we saw that you also have some research projects on pig farmers in Pampanga, Philippines. Did you experience any similar challenges between Timor-Leste and the Philippines when it comes to managing pig farms? Dr. Barnes? Yep, I'm just, just unmuting, I'm a bit slow. Um, I think so, yes. I mean, the, the situation of um, smallholder pig raising in the Philippines um, is a bit different to what I experienced in, or certainly in Pampanga in the Philippines, is a bit different to what I experienced in Timor-Leste in that it was um, much more... Um, Keeping confined pigs was much more common, um, but I think one of the key things there was that, and, and all my work there was before we had that, or before you um, started to experience your um, uh, outbreak of African swine fever. Um, the common theme, though, I think, is the um, the human component. Um, I, we were very lucky um, in that project that we also had a couple of social scientists on the team, as well as the, the scientists and the vets. Um, one was um, a, a colleague from the University of Queensland, and another was um, a colleague um, from uh, the Philippines himself, the local um, Kappa Pangan um, uh, social science graduate. And I think um, having that um, aspect um, strong in our project in, it helped us to engage with the farmers with the, the, the human related issues that were, were a commonality across the, across the two. I hope that sort of halfway answers the question. Okay, thank you, Dr. Barnes. 
Uh, our next question is for Dr. Bakud again. And this was again asked already via Zoom, but we encourage Dr. Bakud to answer it live. Um, in the Philippines, do we have any application or system that can be used for surveillance? So, uh, at present, uh, the Philippines has its Philippine Animal Health Information System, or PhilAHIS, which receives uh, online reports from the field uh, coming from our local government counterparts and from farmers themselves. Though, uh, I think due to uh, the challenge of internet connection, uh, this platform has not been fully utilized uh, at present. Of, uh, there is also the, the idea of uh, a surveillance application or program has also been conceptualized and being developed uh, in the department. Okay, sir. So for our colleague who asked this question, uh, the surveillance system is still being developed as of date. Uh, we have a next couple of questions which is very relevant to today and we'd like both uh, speakers to answer it. Uh, the first question is from Saifu or Maisim. The question is, in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic, what did you practice to avoid COVID-19 uh, to affect uh, with animals, to affect animals? Uh, let's have Dr. Barnes first. Um, I don't actually have anything to comment on the COVID-19 situation because um, my project work all finished um, before this, pretty much at the arrival of COVID-19. Um, and um, since then, until literally just now, I've been on, on, on long service leave. So I, I haven't had the, that challenge of, of dealing with COVID-19 in, in the work or project space. So, sorry, I can't add anything there. Okay, thank you, Dr. Barnes. Uh, Dr. Bukad, is there any effort from coming from the Philippine government with regards to the COVID-19 pandemic and how it affects animals? For, for, for the Philippines, uh, especially in the livestock sector, at present, uh, there is not much... Um, effort that has been uh, uh, focused on the study of COVID-19 uh, in animals. But uh, there has been uh, exploratory uh, meetings with international counterparts, particularly OIE and uh, FAO, uh, on um, exploring the field of studying COVID-19 in, in animals as part of the One Health approach uh, being uh, supported globally by the different uh, concerned agencies. Uh, a follow-up question for that, sir, is um, uh, have we determined ways to detect and determine possible symptoms of COVID-19 in animals? Do we have that already? Um, at present, uh, there's none. Oh, okay. Thank you, sir. A um, uh, next question that we have, speaker uh, from a guest, again from Zoom. The question is, zoonotic infections are believed to be caused by eating exotic animals, such as bats and armadillos. Uh, as part of biosecurity, do the international and national platforms ever consider setting a regulation on limiting consumption of wildlife that are believed to be reservoirs of infectious diseases? Uh, let's start with the Philippine setting, uh, Dr. Bukan. Yes. Um, pertaining to, to wildlife, uh, this is under the jurisdiction of the Department of, Agri uh, Department of Environment and Natural Resources uh, under the... Uh, prim uh, specifically the Biodiversity Management Bureau. But... Uh, there, there have been collaboration between the Bureau of Animal Industry and uh, the, the Biodiversity Management Bureau in conducting several field studies uh, concerning wild, uh, wildlife. Um, we have a few more questions lined, but in the interest of time, we will be sending your comments and questions to our speakers for them to answer, and we will share them via email to those who ask the questions. Uh, before we close this webinar, may I request our speakers for some closing or takeaway message? 
Uh, let's start with uh, Dr. Barnes. Oh, you should have warned me about this. <laughs> Um, well, I'd like to, to thank everybody who has or organized this um, uh, this session and um, everybody who's joined in. Um, I have certainly enjoyed listening to both the other speakers um, talking on very important topics. Um, and, and I have learned a lot. I sincerely hope that um, the rest of you have uh, have also learned um, some useful information too. So thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Barnes. Uh, Dr. Bukad, it's your turn. Yes, um, again, in, on behalf of uh, our director, Dr. Rildrin Morales, uh, the Bureau of Animal Industry would like to express its appreciation uh, to CIRCA for organizing this event and giving us the opportunity to share uh, an overview of what the, the Philippine government initiatives are when it comes to animal disease control and uh, prevention. So uh, as a take home message, uh, especially for, for our uh, partners here in the Philippines, <coughs> sorry, um, we would like to enjoin your cooperation and uh, please coordinate with the local government authorities, if there are any event of disease, especially in animals in your areas. With that, maraming salamat po. Thank you, Dr. Bukad. On behalf of CIRCA, led by our director, Dr. Glenn Gregorio, we would like to express our sincere gratitude to Dr. Bukad, Dr. Barnes, and Dr. Koch for taking the time to join us today. It has been a pleasure to have, with you, to have you with us this morning. That ends our webinar, but before we close, please let us know what you think about this webinar by following the link to a quick feedback form shown on your screen. The same link will direct you to the request form for the e-certificate. Your feedback will help us improve our online learning events. Please note that we will only accommodate requests for e-certificates within 24 hours after the end of this webinar. Kindly wait for your e-certificate to be issued at least within a month as we receive a lot of requests for e-certificates. Thank you for your understanding and patience. Please join us again for our next online conversation, which is next week, February 24, 2021. We have invited speakers who will discuss antimicrobial resistance detection through a One Health approach. Please don't miss it. Let us help one another get through this COVID-19 pandemic. We hope that as we go along, we will be able to create a community of bigger, better, and smarter farmers and farming communities. Once again, this is Jean Labios for Circa. Have a good day, stay, stay healthy, stay safe, and goodbye everyone.